Well, good morning. I want to start by introducing you to Mason. This, this guy right here sitting with me uh, is a guy named Mason. Mason's a high school senior, and uh, over the past three weeks, or over the past three years uh, since I met Mason at the gym, we've developed a great friendship. We've had a few spiritual conversations. Mason's actually been irrelevant a couple times, but three weeks ago, something really, really, really cool happened. Uh, Mason and I met at Scooters for coffee, and right there at Scooters uh, on Saturday morning, Mason prayed to put his faith in Jesus right there in the middle of Scooters. Isn't that awesome? So cool. Is that, is that you down there, Mason? You got your hat on? There's Mason right there. Say hi, Mason. There he is. <laughs> Uh, I'm so pumped about what happened in Mason's life, I had to just share that with you as we kind of land this plane on this series that we have called Likeable. And if this is your first time, what we've discovered over the last few weeks is that people who were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus, and he liked them too. And that, to me, is just the coolest thing in the world. I mean, Jesus liked people who were nothing like him, and he liked them because they are who he came to this world for. Jesus said the entire reason that God sent him was to seek and to save those who were lost, those who have a broken relationship with Holy Creator God because of their violation of sin against him. And that's you and me and every single person. Jesus, it was clear that our Heavenly Father sent him on a mission to restore and redeem and reconcile our broken relationship with him in this life and in the next. That's what Jesus gave his life on the cross for, and that's what Jesus rose from the grave to do and prove that only he can do. Jesus liked people who were nothing like him because they are who he came to this world for, and people who were nothing like Jesus liked Jesus. And the reason they liked him is because of how they perceived him. I mean, the way Jesus talked and acted, responded, interacted, made people who were nothing like Jesus, lost people, like you and me, perceived Jesus as someone who was like a bull, and that made them want to know him. So the question we've been confronting in this series is, how do people who don't follow Jesus perceive those of us who claim that we do? And it's an important question because right before Jesus physically left this earth, after his resurrection, right before he physically ascended, he called us, his followers, his church, to be his body and carry on his mission of seeking and saving those who are lost by sharing the good news of his love, truth, forgiveness, grace, salvation, hope, and joy with them. And this is just not just something we're called to do as followers of Christ. It's actually who we are. Jesus and the writers of the New Testament tell us that as followers of Christ, as people who have put our faith in Jesus by asking him to be the forgiver of our sins and leader of our life, that we are now the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. We are Christ's ambassadors sent on a mission to draw people, to draw the world to God. Which means, if you're a follower of Christ, it means you can't follow Jesus without carrying on Jesus' mission. And it means you aren't following Jesus if you aren't influencing people toward Jesus. So let me ask you again. How do people perceive those of us who claim to be followers of Christ? You and me. It's an important question because perception matters. It matters because perception impacts likability, and likability impacts relationship because if someone doesn't like you, they don't want to have a relationship with you, and that's a really big deal because relationship impacts influence because influence happens within the context of relationship. And the reality is that you don't have to look too deep to discover is that the, the way many people perceive those of us who claim to be followers of Christ is making us very unlikable. And not only is that preventing people from wanting to know us, it's preventing pe many people from wanting to know the person whom we say we follow, Jesus. So we can't be okay with this. That we must do everything we can to change people's negative perceptions of us because we are the salt of the earth, the light of the world, Christ's ambassadors. And that's what we've been attempting to do throughout the series. Throughout the series, we're looking at four, four common negative perceptions people have with followers of Christ and identifying some next step solutions for how to change those perceptions. Over the past three weeks, we talked about three of these negative perceptions that, that were sheltered or hypocritical we're judgmental, and by the way, if you're a follower of Christ, I would just encourage you, if you missed any of those weeks, to go back and watch them. Go back and watch them because the implications of you being a solution to this problem, the implications are huge. They're huge for people who don't know Jesus. They're huge for our church. They're huge for you as a follower of Christ. So if you missed any, go back and watch. The fourth negative perception that people have of followers of Christ that we're going to look at today as we kind of end this series is that people would say that you're against me. You're against me. Now, let me just state the obvious here. 
This should never be perceived about us. This should never be perceived about us because God is for people. God is for people who are lost. God is for people who have a broken relationship with him because of their violation of sin against him. God is for people who have rejected him. God's for people who have said no to him. God's for people who have turned their backs on him. You know, people like you and me. And we know that God is for people because, as we've talked about every single week, lost people are who our Heavenly Father sent Jesus to seek and to save. And this is the reality, and this is so important. The only way people will know that God is for them is if we are. Those of us who are followers of Christ, Christ's ambassadors are. But unfortunately, we're not perceived as being for people nearly as much as we are perceived as being against people. Now, it's really, really easy to assume that what's make, what makes people perceive that we're against them are our positions. And I guarantee you have some doctrinal, theological, spiritual, moral, social, political, ideological positions that you believe deeply are true and you believe deeply are right. And as a follower of Christ, a position I hope you firmly believe is, believe is true, I hope a position you firmly believe is right, is that for God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life, and that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. Man, I hope that you believe this position to be right and, to believe, and believe it to be true. And you believe it so much to be right and true that you want to share the good news of what Jesus' death and resurrection means for every single person. And fortunately, many of us do believe this position to be right and true. Unfortunately, it's created a negative perception from people that you're against me. I mean, we want people to know what we believe to be true and right so badly that we often tell them regardless if they want to know it or if they're ready to know it. And as you know, many times they end up disagreeing and pushing back, ignoring us, dismissing us. Some of us have even public, been publicly disrespected, privately shamed, called names. You're closed-minded, shallow, ignorant. And what happens so easily and sometimes so quickly is we become defensive. We become angry. And some of us has even, have even aggressively retaliated with hurtful words and behaviors. I remember when I was a senior in high school, I put my faith in Jesus right before my junior year. When I was a senior in high school, I was a captain of the football team. And right before practice was getting ready to start, I heard one of the players shaming in front of, in front of the entire team another one of the players for being, a, for being a follower of Christ. And I'm like, all right. He gonna play it like this. I'm the captain of the football team. I'll shame him. I'll shame him in front of him. I went over to him and I beat him like a Cherokee drum in front of the entire team. And I thought I was doing God a favor. Like, I mean, I'm pretty sure at that after that moment he wasn't thinking this guy is for me. You know, I think this guy, this guy's against me. Now you've probably never gone to that extreme. I hope you never go to that extreme. But our attitudes and our words and our behaviors have made people perceive that we are against them. I mean, you've probably heard something like this said about us. You think you're right and everyone else is wrong and you push, push, push your beliefs and your positions and your behaviors and your Bible on me and as soon as I disagree with you, you can't handle it. You just push harder and harder and harder and you become hateful, harsh, angry, and unkind. So hey, let's just be honest with one another. You don't like me and I don't like you. And if that's what your loving God is like, I don't want to have anything to do with him either. And now some of you at this point are going, well, that's just their problem because I'm right. And they need to know they're wrong. And how will they know if we don't tell them? I mean, Ronnie, this is what the writers of the New Testament tell us to do. I mean, you've heard of Paul, right, Ronnie? Like Paul, who wrote a majority of our New Testament and made a bigger difference in the world than anybody for Jesus. Paul wrote, well, how then can they call on the one whom they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? I mean, come on, Ronnie. And then what about Peter? Like, Ronnie, you know Peter. Peter was one of Jesus' 12 disciples and one of Jesus' closest friends. And Peter himself said this, always be prepared to give an answer to anyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. Now, come on, we, let's be honest. We want to be heard. Everyone does. 
We and everyone else wants to be heard. And when someone has a position that we don't agree with, we naturally want to talk and preach at them more and more and more because we want to be heard. And we have all the reasons for justifying why we want to be heard. And we have all the, re- the verses to justify why we should be heard. And they didn't, they, we go, hey, they need to know the right position so they can change their wrong position. And how will that happen if I don't tell them right now? And the reality of it is, is they're thinking the same thing you're thinking. And since we all want to be heard, their natural inclination is your, and your natural inclination is just to talk at each other. And what that never results in is changing each other's position. Never once has your position been changed on anything because someone who disagrees with you started preaching at you. And you've never changed someone else's position that disagrees with you because you started preaching at them. Ten times out of ten, ten times out of ten, the result is tension and the result is conflict. And what happens is they and we, we close up mentally and emotionally and relationally and physically to one another. And physically, closed hands are only good for one thing. Fighting. And that fighting sooner or later results into them concluding, you are against me. And that makes people perceive us as very unlikable and makes them perceive that we don't like them. The result is a broken relationship which, which equates into the inability to, to positively influence them because influence happens within the context of relationship. Furthermore, when people perceive that we, as followers of Christ, as people who claim that we follow Jesus, are against them, they quickly conclude that our loving God is against them and that pushes them away from Jesus. Listen, as the salt of the earth, as the light of the world, as Christ's ambassadors, we can't be okay with this. We must change this negative perception. And to change it, we, not they, we need to change something. When I say next is so important, so please hang with me here. We don't need to change our positions but we must change our posture. We don't need to change and compromise our positions to to positively influence people toward Jesus. Our positions are not the primary reason people perceive we're against them. Our posture is. So in order to change people's negative perception of us, we simply need to change our posture. And the posture I'm going to be challenging all of us to take today is this. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. Now, as a follower of Christ, you need to pay attention to what we're about ready to talk about today. If you're not a follower of Christ, you don't believe the Bible is even true and accurate, and man, I'm so glad you're here. Thank thank you seriously so much for being here, for tuning in. You obviously don't have to apply anything I'm talking about today, but listen, I think you, you can apply and you should apply, even if you don't believe what's written in the Bible is true, because if you do, if you apply this, it will make your relationships better. But for those of us who are followers of Christ, we've got to apply this. Now, be quick to listen and slow to speak. This is one of the most powerful postures we can take to show people that we are for them because it's so countercultural. As I said before, everyone, including you and me, wants to be heard. Therefore, what do we do? We are quick to speak and slow to listen. And all that does is create relational tension and conflict and cause people to close up and fight with each other and conclude, you're against me. But when we are quick to listen and slow to speak, it communicates that we're open to people and that naturally makes people more open to us. Being quick to listen and slow to speak, it's a game changer. It's a game changer to become more likable. It's a game, game changer to change people's negative perception of us. However, we're going to discover applying this affects so much more than that. Now, I didn't come up with this posture. I actually stole it from Jesus' younger brother, James. And James is actually the author of one of our New Testament books, 
called James. <laughs> the book of James is actually a letter that James wrote to the first century church 15 or 20 years after the uh, events of Jesus' life. And toward the beginning of James's letter, he introduced this posture. He wrote, my dear brothers and sisters, he's writing to followers of Christ, my dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. He's basically saying, what I'm about to say is so important, I need you to straighten up and write this down. Everyone, who? Everyone, he's saying, everyone should be quick to listen. He's like, hey, you want to be heard, right? You want to positively influence for Jesus, people for Jesus, right? Well, then take the posture of being quick to listen. And here's our next statement, slow to speak. And the idea here, by the way, is, is to be late when it comes to your words, to, to wait and be late. And you may go on, well, how in the world do I do that? And this is super deep. This is going to blow your mind. You ready? You ask a question. Whenever someone has a different position than we do that we don't agree with, the way that we take the posture of being quick to listen and slow to speak is by asking questions. Well, if I do, they're going to keep talking. And what do I do then? Ask three more questions. Just keep providing more on-ramps for them to talk. And you're like, why in the world should I do that? And the why is because it's one of the most powerful postures you can take to show people that you're for them. It's how people feel heard and how they know you care about them. And as you already know, people don't care how much you know until they know how much you care. But it's also powerful for us too because it's how we learn about them where they're coming from, why they feel the way they feel, why they've drawn the conclusions that they've drawn, why they've made the assumptions that they've made. And this learning for us is so powerful. I'll tell you why in, in just a second. But some of you may be going, listen, I don't care about learning. I want to be heard. And you are more than welcome to take that posture. But you need to ask yourself, has that posture ever helped anything? Has that posture ever changed someone's position, their mind, their behavior? Has that posture of just you just talking at everybody ever positively influenced people toward Jesus? The answer is no. And if you're like, no, it has. No, it hasn't. Go ask them. It's just created a you against me gap. You know, come on, you know everything would change if everyone else did this. If everyone else was quick to listen and slow to speak, but this isn't about everyone else. This is about you. This is about me. Listen, if we get those two ideas right, be quick to listen, slow to speak, the next part, the next part becomes super easy. Look what he writes. And slow to become angry. Now, as I said before, it's so easy to feel angry when people have a different position. When people say and do and behave and, and believe things that we don't like, that we become offended by, that we don't believe. When people disagree with us, push back against us, belittle us, or oppose our position, positions. And James would go, listen, when that happens, be slow to become angry. Now, James is not talking about not feeling angry. That's not possible because you can't control how you feel. James is talking about not letting your internal anger express itself externally in hurtful ways, words, or actions because when we do, it hurts them and it hurts our relationship with them. No relationship has ever improved. Hear what I'm saying? No relationship has ever improved when someone expressed anger in hurtful ways because hurtful words and actions communicate, I'm against you. James is essentially saying one of the best ways to not express hurtful anger is by taking the posture of being quick to listen and slow to speak. Well, James, I'd rather tell them why they're wrong and I'm right. And that may be easier, but it's so destructive. Listen, you know this would be a game changer in your relationships. You know this would be a game changer in people perceiving that we're for them and not against them. Now, if James had stopped right there, that would be enough. But James isn't finished. He goes on to say, because human anger, like anger expressing itself on the outside in hurtful ways, that's human anger, does not produce or not, does not result in or cultivate the righteousness 
or the rightness, that's what that word means, that God desires. When we are quick to speak and slow to listen, we're essentially saying, I'm right, and I want you to know I'm right. And that's called my rightness or self-righteousness. And our feelings of anger easily produce that. And James is going, that's not the rightness or the righteousness that God desires. He's saying, that's not the right right. What James is drawing us into right here is so huge. He's essentially saying the righteousness that God desires is being right with them. We naturally want them to know that they're wrong and our positions are right. But what God desires is that we're right with them. Come on. Did you know that you can win, win an, that when you win an argument, you don't win anything? Married people do. <laughs> when you win an argument, you don't win anything. Did, did you know that fighting to be right, even if you are, can actually make things worse? Because you can write a person right out of the relationship. You can be right and be right and be right about your positions and write them right out of their relationship. And this is so important. You can fight to be, you can fight for your right position, or you could take the posture of fighting for the relationship, but very rarely can you fight for both. Let me say that again. You can, you can fight for your right position. Or you can take the posture of fighting for the relationship, but very rarely can you fight for both at the same time. And it's, this is so important because as soon as you lose the relationship, you lose something extraordinarily important. You lose the opportunity. You lose the ability to have positive influence because the potential for influence happens within the context of relationship. Listen, we may be right, but when we lose the relationship, we're wrong. Because we've lost the ability and, and them know, we've lost the ability in them to know that God loves them and God is for them. When we lose the relationship, you guys, this is so important. When we lose the relationship, we take Jesus out of their life and out of the relationship because we are the salt of the earth. We are the light of the world. We are Christ's ambassadors. Did you know this posture of being quick to listen and slow to speak is exactly how Jesus first loved us? And is one of the reasons he was so darn likable. I mean, you guys think about it. If Jesus came to be right, it would have taken him about 30 seconds. Let me just get all the wrong people together, that's basically everyone, and tell you that you, 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 you're wrong, go through door number one, right through that fiery furnace right over there, and burn in hell. He just would have called down lightning. It would have taken him 30 seconds, and he would have been right. But Jesus did not come to be right at people. He came to seek and to save those who were lost. He came to provide the way for us to be made right with God. And so what did he do? He opened his hands to people who didn't deserve it, to wrong people, to people who had sinned against their heavenly father, to people who were unworthy of his love. And he listened to them and he served them and he welcomed them. And then he spread his hands out and had nails driven through them on a cross for us to offer us forgiveness, redemption, restoration, salvation, and eternal life. And now he looks at his followers, at you and at me, and he commands us to love others just as he first loved us. James goes on, therefore, he's saying, let me tell you how, how, what, what you're going to need to do in order to maintain this posture of being quick to listen and slow to speak. Therefore, get rid of, which means literally take off, take off, get rid of all moral filth. He's saying, when you're quick to listen, or excuse me, when you're quick to speak, when you're just being quick to speak, you're walking around with the I'm right coat on. And you got to take that self-righteousness thing off. And the reason he used the, the phrase moral filth is because self-rightness or self-righteousness quickly becomes a moral issue. It's what causes us to sin against others, 
hurt others, violate others, harm others. Isn't it true? I mean, think about it. Isn't it true that physical, emotional, mental harm generally begins with our words? Everybody's talking and nobody's listening. And James is saying, if you're going to follow Jesus by being for the people that he is for, you got to take that moral filth off. And we got to take something else off too. He says, and the evil, and in this context, evil is the desire to be heard first, to get even, to pay back, to control, to manipulate, to express hurtful anger. He calls it evil. you got to take off that evil that is so prevalent. Why? Because that's the posture that epitomizes our culture. That's how the world operates. And Jesus looks at his disciples, his followers, and he says, not so with you. When we realize that we have the I'm right jacket on with people, we need to take it off because it's moral filth and it's evil. Even if we win, we're wrong because we lose the relationship. And here's what we need to put on instead. And, and this next word is huge, humbly. Humbly accept. We take off the jacket of self-righteousness and we put on humility. Humility says, me being right with you, me being right with you is more important than me trying to show you how right I am. And humbly accept, James says, the word planted in you. Now, remember, James is writing to followers of Christ, the people who put their faith in Jesus. And James is saying, humbly accept, receive today the same good news that you accepted that was planted in you when you put your faith in Jesus by asking him to be the forgiver of your sins and leader of your life. Jesus' love, his mercy, his grace, his sacrifice that you didn't deserve, that God so loved you that he sent his son for you to reconcile you with him. He's saying, humbly accept that today. By doing the same things for others. By, being the, by having the posture of being quick to listen and slow to speak. And then James closes by telling us why this is such a big deal. Which can save you. Now James is not talking about saving you eternally. He's not talking about heaven and hell and being saved from eternal death and receiving eternal life. That happened the moment that we put our faith in Jesus and asked him to be the forgiver of our sins and leader of our life. He's talking about saving you now. On one hand, saving the relationship. On the other hand, saving you from the self-righteousness and the anger and the hatred that not only kills the relationship, but destroys you The posture of being quick to listen and slow to speak is one of the ways, come on, this is so huge. It's one of the the ways that we invite Jesus into our relationships. It's one of the ways we invite Jesus into their lives and invite Jesus into our lives. And that's the only way to experience the transforming work that Jesus can and wants to do in them and in you. We can, we, can, we can change our posture without changing or compromising our positions that we believe to be right and true. And not only can we change our posture, we should and we must because that's exactly what Jesus did for us. One of the most powerful postures that we can take to change people's negative perception of us is to be quick to listen and slow to speak. This posture is so powerful because it communicates, I care about you and I am for you. And people perceiving that about us is the best chance we have for them to be open to us. And that's the only way we'll be able to share the good news of Jesus. Love, truth, forgiveness, joy, grace, hope, peace, and salvation with them. Of which right now you might be saying, well, if I'm going to share that, I have to talk at some point. Being quick to listen and slow to speak assumes that eventually I do speak. So when can I speak? And when should I speak? And the apostle Peter tells us when. And he does so in the same verse we use to justify being quick to speak at people. 
Here's what Peter wrote. He said, but in your hearts, revere, revere Christ as Lord. He's saying, submit to, glorify, honor, follow Jesus as the leader of your life, as your Lord, your God. And here's how to do that with people who oppose your right and your true positions. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone. When, Peter? When? When they ask you. To give a reason for the hope you have. <laughs> you can see right away what Peter's getting at here. He's saying, be slow to speak by waiting to speak until you're asked a question. Peter instructs us to always be prepared to give, not a sermon, to give an answer for our faith in Jesus. To give an answer for why we believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except for him. To give an answer for the hope we have in Jesus. To give an answer assumes that a question was first asked. This is so important that you remember what I'm about ready to say. It's important on so many different levels that you remember this. Basically for every relationship. If someone hasn't asked you a question, they aren't interested in what you have to say. Let me say it slower so we all got it. If someone has not asked you a question, they aren't interested in what you have to say. Until someone asks you a question, they're not looking for an answer from you. I mean, you guys, this is not rocket science. You don't need the Bible to know that. Until someone asks you a question, until you ask someone a question, you're not looking for them to give you an answer, which means as much as then you want to be heard, you'll, they'll never hear you until they ask you. When people ask a question is when they want to know and when they're most open and receptive to what they have, to what you have to say. Now, I introduced you to my buddy Mason a little bit earlier. And I told you that Mason and I, a few weeks ago, we met at Scooters, and Mason that morning prayed to put his faith in Jesus. What I didn't tell you is how we got to Scooters. So a couple days before this, um, I was getting ready to leave the gym, and Mason was at the front counter talking with his dad, who's a good friend of mine, and Karis, who's one of, our, uh, one of our LDP interns, talking, and they're talking about college. Mason's a senior in high school, and, you know, he's trying to figure out where he goes, should he go, money, all that stuff for college. And I can just tell, looking at Mason, he's stressed out. Like, he's you just see it on his face. This kid is stressed out because he doesn't know where he should go, doesn't know what to do about the money thing. Just, and he's just stressed out because he wasn't sure. Well, because of the past three years of developing a relationship with Mason and the hundreds of questions that I've asked him over the past three years, I knew that he believed in God. And so I'm, this kid's just like stressed out. And so before I walked out, I said, hey, Mason, I don't know where you're at on your spiritual journey, but I'm, you know, I know that you have faith in God on some level. So the, because of that, I'm assuming that you probably would like to do it his way. And you, I'm assuming you think his ways are probably better than your ways. And he's like, yeah. And I'm like, well, why don't you just ask God about this? Like, God, what, what would you have me do? Like, just ask him about that. And you have a few months. You have to make up. You just pray about that, man, and ask him. I think he'll lead you. And I walked out. Like, now was the end of the conversation. Ten minutes later, Mason texts me. And he said, Ronnie, when you said, I don't know where you're at in your spiritual journey, the only thought that entered my mind is, I don't know where I'm at on my spiritual journey either. And then, listen, what he wrote next was huge. This was huge, what he wrote next. He said, can you help me? He asked me a question. And I'm like, yeah, bro, let's get together. So I went to Scooters. We lined up a time, went to Scooters, and we sat down. And when we sat down, I did not start preaching at Mason. But instead, I started asking him. I said, hey, Mason, you said you wanted help. You know our you want help. Dude, how can I help you, man? Like, I want to help you as much as I can. And then, so Mason just started asking me questions. And I just started answering his questions. And he just kept asking another one, and I'd answer another one. And we just would sit there for an hour, him just asking me questions. And we got to the end of it, and I'm like, hey, man, let me ask you a question. Like, what's stopping you from putting your faith in Jesus? You know, and asking him to be the forgiver of your sins and lead your life. And he's like, nothing's stopping me from doing that. I'm like, 
well, dude, you should do that then. He's like, I'm going to do it. And I'm like, cool. And I was like, you could do it later at home. We, we can do it right now. Like, dude, what, what would you like to do? He's like, let's do it right now. I'm like, let's do it, you know. And so, you know, we put our faith in Jesus. But here, this is so, this is so important. Mason put his faith in Jesus that day because Mason was receptive. And what made Mason receptive was that Mason wanted to know. If I had out of the blue one morning at the gym just gone, hey, Mason, let's schedule an appointment to go to Scooter so I can preach Jesus to you, he would not have put his faith in Jesus that day at Scooter's. Mason asked, and I was prepared to give an answer for the hope that I have when he asked. Asking questions to people is practically how we're quick to listen. Waiting to be asked a question before we talk, talk at someone is practically how we are slow to speak. But how we say what we say when we're asked is maybe more important than what we actually say, which is why Peter said what he did next. But do this with gentleness and respect. Peter's saying, hey, if and when you get an opportunity to answer a, qu a question that they ask you and actually speak, make sure that your words are kind instead of harsh. Make sure your words build them up instead of tear them down. Make sure your words are helpful instead of hurtful. Make sure your words point them to the good news of Jesus instead of pushes them away from Jesus. Make sure your words are, are filled with both grace and truth. Make sure your words communicate that you're for them and not against them. And Here's the reality that is just so, so important for us to remember. Your words will either point people to the good news of Jesus or will push them away from Jesus. The words that come out of your and my mouth, this is so important. Your words will either point people to the good news of Jesus or will push them away from Jesus. That's true with people who know Jesus. That's true with people who don't know Jesus. That's true with people who agree with you. That's true with people who don't agree with you. This right here, this is true with your family, your friends, your kids, each other. And it's true with the people whom Jesus came to seek and to save. You, I, we are the salt of the earth, the light of the world, Christ's ambassadors. So let me ask you a question. Are your words helping point people to the good news of Jesus or pushing people away from Jesus? It's doing one or the other. If your words are causing relational tension, if your words are causing people to close up to you or to Jesus, if your words are causing people to perceive that you're against them, it's time to change your position and be quick to listen and slow to speak. And let me tell you, this is going to be really hard for some of you. I've met you. <laughs> if you have a hard time doing this, listen, if you have a hard time doing this, and right now you're justifying in your mind all the reasons why you are the exception to the rule, let me tell you what that means. There is some transforming work that God wants to do in you. God wants to transform you to have the same heart for people that he does. So if you have a hard time doing this, you need to start praying for yourself. God, give me the same love for them that you have for them. God, give me the same love for them that you have for them. If you pray fervently, I believe God will begin to change your heart. And when he does, you will be much more willing and able to change your posture. And if we choose to change our posture, you guys, if we do this, we will start to change people's negative perception of us. If we do this, we'll be more likable. If we do this, we'll ensure every time we open our mouth that the words that come out of our mouth are truly filled with news that is good news. Let me pray for us. Dear Lord, uh, I just thank you for the opportunity to do this series. And um, I, I feel like I beat me up a lot in this series. And um, Lord, sometimes we need that a little bit. 
but I pray that this just, that we're motivated and we're inspired and we're committed to follow you, Jesus, into this, um, to do everything we can to share the good news of you with people, doing whatever that means that we need to do in order for that to happen better. Real quick, with everyone just your head bowed and eyes closed real quick, everyone who would say either in the room or watching online that you've never put your faith in Jesus, um, and maybe there's a stirring in you that you wanted to do that. Um, I just want to ask you the same question I asked Mason sitting at scooters that day. What's stopping you? What's stopping you from doing that today? If nothing, why not right now? And if you're ready, you can just quietly pray where you're right, pray where you're at. Like, Jesus, I I confess that my violation of sin against God broke the relationship that God you created me for with you. I'm declaring I need a savior to save me from my violation of sin against God. And Jesus, I believe you are that Savior because of your death and resurrection. And right now, Jesus, I'm asking you to be my Savior. Right now, Jesus, I'm putting my faith in you, asking you to be the forgiver of my sins and the leader of my life my Lord, my God. I want to follow you, Jesus. Lord, thank you for every person who's praying that prayer right now. Um, I pray that your spirit takes residence within them and you fill them with the life that only you can. You show them the next step to take to follow you so that they're more transformed into everything you created them to be. In Jesus' name, amen.